Let's see, we can start in a minute, right? Let's wait another minute to see, to let other people enter. Okay. Um, Odette, do you, we can start? Yeah, I don't know if people can hear me or not. Yes, right. Can you hear us, myself and Odette? Yes. Show me. Show me. Show me. Thank you. Great. Great. Okay. So uh, I'd like to welcome Odette Salumi to, um, to our meeting to give our mini course and we're very honored to have Oded with us here. Uh, my name is Ophira Eliav and I'm the managing director of uh, the FinTech Center, the Gershon FinTech Center uh, at the Hebrew University, the business school of the Hebrew University. And um, uh, uh, the Gershon, I, I, I'll, Tell you a bit about the Gershon FinTech Center, what we do in the, in the Gershon FinTech Center of the Hebrew University was founded by Professor uh, David Dudi Gershon in, in 2018, and is named, named after his parents, Sima and Shlomo Gershon. Professor Gershon is a 25-year veteran of the FinTech industry. He founded the Super Derivatives, uh, and the FinTech Center is situated in the academia and is aimed to create an ecosystem for the FinTech industry in Israel, including FinTech startups, entrepreneurs, financial institutions, and investors. Um, uh, among all of that, we also give uh, MBA courses like uh, entrepreneurship in FinTech, Finnovation and uh, other courses. Uh, and this time we are um, opening this mini uh, course, online mini course uh, taught by Oded Salomi. Uh, this course is the Paytech Frontier, understanding the payments industry, its challenges and opportunities. Odette Salomi is the director of payment systems and a member of the top management team at the Bank of Israel. Odette previously led Visa in Israel and other markets, founded the Visa, Visa's Tel Aviv Innovation Studio and held a number of payment, uh, payments related executive roles in the high tech industry. Odette is a corporate attorney by training with a JD from the University of Pennsylvania and the BA uh, with honors from Harvard University. So thank you very much, Oded, for uh, being with us here. And uh, the stage is yours. And you're welcome to start. Well, thank you, Afira. <clears throat> very glad to be here and very glad to be giving this course. I have to say, um, we were quite surprised by the number of registrants. Um, we have, I think it's 260 people who signed up from all over the world, um, including the US and Europe, the OECD, some American banks, um, and certainly many of our friends and colleagues from, from here in Israel. Um, this will be, as Ophira mentioned, a four uh, lecture mini course. Um, each lecture is about a, a one and a half hours. I will try to um, keep time. So uh, if we don't finish what we wanna do today, uh, we'll continue the next time. And if I manage to finish a little early, which is my hope, then we'll have a few minutes for questions and answers. It will be a bit difficult to make this interactive because we already have 82 people on the line. I don't know how many <laughs> will ultimately join. Um, but let's see how, the, how, how we, this can work. Obviously, we'd love to have you all in one room together, but since we are all over the world, it's actually a good thing that this is virtual. Um, Called this course, first of all, could you, um, Ophira, can you see the screen? Yeah, okay, good. So I called this course 
the Paytech frontier. Um, Paytech really is a frontier. And what I'd like to um, say at the outset is what this course is and what this course is not. So this is certainly a course about payment technologies, which have been growing and developing very rapidly. Um, and it is designed to describe what's happening globally. Um, I am a, uh, a member of management of the Bank of Israel and I am director of payment systems and settlement. And so um, that is certainly my day job, but I am not here to talk about the Israel market. That's not the purpose of the course. And I'm not here to provide a regulatory view as a regulator because I am also a, a supervisor of payment systems. Um, I am here to share thoughts and trends and, and perhaps some insights about the payments industry. So important to say that up front, um, this is not a regulatory view or opinion. Um, and so please don't read anything into what I say in terms of, you know, what we will or will not do as a central bank. Um, you will note this is being recorded and it will also be published on the Bank of Israel YouTube channel, as well as the Gershon Fintech Center's digital channel. I'm not sure exactly where, but I guess on their website. On our website, yes. Okay. Um, and so those of you who want to come back and kind of revisit something I said or someone asked, you can do that on the recording. Um, or if you miss a lecture, uh, you can certainly make it up by viewing it um, recording. In the recording, we will be meeting every two weeks. And also for those who are asking themselves, if you are an MBA student at Hebrew University, good for you. This is a, a an unaccredited uh, course. So you're not going to get any academic uh, credits for this. We're here to learn and have fun, but it is not, there, there won't be a test at the end. All right. So I, actually, let me, one more thing. I'm going to start out talking a little bit about the payment sector as a sector um, in broad strokes. Then we'll um, look at all the topics we want to cover. And the, today we'll really only cover the first topic, which is what is the business case for payments? Meaning, why do people want to be active in the payments industry from a business perspective? And then we'll go through a number of trends. I hope we'll get through all of them. Um, things that are happening and that I believe will be happening in the coming. So, payment sector has been doing phenomenally well. If we look at payments companies and their price to book ratios out of the different categories of financial services, it is absolutely incredible. The payment sector has a price to book ratio on average 8.5 times bigger than universal banks. That is truly phenomenal. If we look at price to book growth over the last five years, universal banks actually dropped by 5%. You see corporate investment banks, consumer financial specialists, wealth management entities were in the range of 27 to 31%. Growth, payments, price to book growth was 66%. Twi more than twice the next runner up. If we look at valuations as of, um, well, the, the increase in the valuations of companies in the, or entities in the financial space during the pandemic, um, we see that there was huge increase between February 20 and October 21. Uh, payments added $422 billion in value during that period alone. Whereas banks in developed markets and there are many more banks and much larger entities than there are payments entities, they added $500 billion in value for comparison. So there are literally thousands of pay tech companies worldwide. We have about, it's between 20 and 30 unicorns in the payment space in Israel alone. 
As you know, a unicorn is a company valued at $1 billion or more. I picked out four um, just to kind of give you a bit of a sense. So a company called Sunbit, which provides payment solutions for retailers, uh, founded in 2016, already raised $162 million. This is just money they raised. They're worth a lot more for all of them. Papaya Global, a company that provides payroll and workforce management tools for global enterprises. There's a real challenge when you want to employ people abroad. How do you do that? How do you manage the money that you need to pay them and comply with all of the employment requirements from a financial perspective? Raised $440 million, founded in 2016. Also a very young company. Payoneer Global provides global payment solutions, primarily in the B2B space, primarily cross-border. Um, a true Israel success story. Raised $282 million, million to date, but they are a public company about a year ago, they did a SPAC. They were founded a little earlier, 2005, but still a fairly young company. Melio Payments, um, very young company founded in 2018. They provide a payment platform for suppliers. We'll talk a little bit more about B2B payments later. Raised $500 million, $4 million to date. And again, this company is only four years old. That's a small sampling, just to give you an idea to whet your appetite. And when we talk about payments, I like to say that payments are part of our lives and almost everything we do. Um, and so just to make this a little bit fun, I thought I'd give you a few examples of the better known stories. So Larry Page and Sergey Brin, as you know, founded Google. And guess how they funded themselves when they got started with a credit card. So Google probably wouldn't be around today if we didn't have a credit card industry. Elon Musk is one of the wealthiest people in the world, if not the wealthiest. We know him for SpaceX. We know him for Tesla. We now know him for Twitter. But guess where he really made his first big mark? It was when he founded a company that was ultimately bought by PayPal, and that kind of made him a co-founder of PayPal in the payment space. We have an extremely unfortunate international security event ongoing where Russia invaded Ukraine. And I don't think it escaped us because it was very much in the news when this all just started. What was the West's first reaction? Suddenly, we were all saying the word SWIFT, which is the way banks send money to each other, internationally and also domestically. One of the very first things the West, the EU, and the US did was cut off a number of government-owned Russian banks from SWIFT as a first measure to assist President Zelensky and his country. And then another interesting image is Vitalik Buterin, young guy who lives in Canada, he's from Russia originally, at the young age of 20, founded Ethereum, co-founded Ethereum with other founders, and it became the second largest cryptocurrency after Bitcoin. Just a taste of how relevant payments are in our lives. Quick commercial break before we dive in. Um, Ophira mentioned Hebrew University. For those of you who are MBA students, first semester, next academic year, I'll be teaching a full course on Paytech. That will be for credit and second semester on regu financial regulation. Um, if you live in Israel, as the central bank, we at the Bank of Israel are hosting a conference on payments on June 20th. So if you're interested, reach out to us and or look on our website and um, we'd, we'd love to have you. We also published recently, it was, I think, in December, a, a book really reviewing the payments landscape in Israel. For, so for those of you interested in the Israel market, we wanted to make it more accessible. If you speak Hebrew, you can watch a webinar we put on our website, which presents everything we're doing or much of what we're doing in the payment space in the Israel market. And that is available on the Bank of Israel website. And I think I saw the host of that event join us here. So hello to Natalie. 
Okay, so the course, you may have seen the flyer, just go to go through it quickly. Um, we are um, going to try to touch on seven topics. As Afira mentioned, it's called the Paytech Frontier, Understanding the Payments Industry, Its Challenges and Opportunities. Um, we'll start today, we'll dedicate all of today to the business case for payments, trends, players, disruption, and retention. Then in future sessions, we'll review payment cards, which include credit cards, debit cards, prepaid cards, in the past, the present, and when they're, where they're going in the future. We'll talk about um, account to account payments. So faster payments, also known as instant payments, when you move money from one bank account to another instantaneously. ACH transfers or wire transfers usually take a few days. Checks are also a way to move money between bank accounts. Um, we'll then talk, dive into digital currencies, including three main ones, central bank digital currencies, stable coins, and programmatic cryptocurrencies, such as, such as Bitcoin and Ether. Those are three main categories of digital currencies. And then we'll also touch on fungible tokens. We'll talk about cross-border payments, which is a huge space of its own, what the ecosystem looks like, how foreign currency works and combines with the cross-border payment schemes because you can't move money from one country with currency A to another country with currency B unless you convert the currency in most cases. And what are the opportunities in cross-borders? We, we think um, cross-border is a space that is continues to be ripe for disruption, although we've seen a lot of progress in the last few years. B2B payments, business to business. Lots of opportunities there. That's a space that we've also seen new initiatives in the last year, really, year or two, including specifically in Israel, including one of the companies I mentioned. Um, so if you have an enterprise platform, for example, for procurement, um, how or how can you integrate with that platform as a payments company in order to improve payments processes? Many of us who work for large institutions and deal with the procurement department know how difficult it can be and how much it can be improved with new technologies. And then another interesting space is looking at the data relating to procurement and invoices and accounts payable uh, and accounts receivable and converting that into credit opportunities. How can I use that data to do smart underwriting for a business customer um, and provide attractive credit? And then finally, we'll also talk about payments regulation. Um, as I said, not necessarily from an Israel perspective, but maybe a little bit more theoretically. Many, many of the principles apply globally. We are in ongoing conversation and engagement with payments regulators across the world. And we see that many of the topics that we look at are the same topics that they look at. Um, and so we'll talk about some of the threats coming from regulation, but also the opportunities I'm a big proponent. I, I was in the business sector until a year and a half ago, so most of my career, and I'm a big proponent of viewing regulation as an opportunity, because many times regulators have agendas that could become business opportunities if treated the right way. So let's dive into number one. That's what I hope to accomplish today. The business case for payments. How do people make money in payments? Why do they do it? Why do they go into it as a field, as a sector? So those of you who have heard my lectures are familiar with my pyramid. It's a model I developed a few years ago and I think it continues to be relevant. If we look at the foundation that I call payments, if we count the number of times a transaction is made, it's a very large number. Think about the number of times a month that you or your business make a payment or receive a payment, it's at least 30 times, probably 60, 90, 100 times. If you aggregate all that data, it's true big data. If we look at the number of times a transaction is made in a current account, it's a much smaller number. And if we look at the number of times there is a transaction in the field of credit, you could probably count it on the fingers of one hand or half the fingers of one hand. How many times a month do I return a loan? Did I pay, do I pay back a loan or do I take out a loan? Quite infrequently. So very little data there. However, 
If we look at revenue and profit, the pyramid flips. A lot more money can be made by providing credit and it can become a lot more profitable if managed correct, if the risk is managed correctly, you don't write off bad loans, than the amount of money that one can make or a company can make in the payments sector. To the extent that in some geographies, there are entities that claim that payments are no longer profitable or that the payments industry can be profitable only if it's at large scale because the margins are so small. So why do it? If, if it's unprofitable, why would anyone go into this space and why are the valuations so high? Something doesn't make sense. There are really two main reasons. Because data is the new gold or the new oil, choose your metaphor, and payments, as we mentioned earlier, create huge amounts of data. That data can be analyzed and converted into business opportunities that generate significant revenue. The second reason is consumer engagement. Because a consumer makes payments so often, he or she is engaged with the digital wallet or whatever platform it is, almost as a matter of daily habits. And habit-forming sectors can be a segue into other products and services. They want our eyeballs. They want to impact our behavior. How can they do that if they don't have our attention? And so when a consumer is engaged with a payments platform, it does provide an opportunity to offer other services. So going back to the pyramid, I said that a lot more money can be made on credit than on payments. But now we understand that the data from payments can be used to underwrite and issue smarter credit and maybe credit where it wasn't available before. But on top of that, using the data and the customer engagement, companies, all the providers add additional products and services. In the financial space, savings, there's a product just as an example called Roundup, where if you buy something for $9.85, they will round it up to $10 and the extra 15 cents go into a savings account. Do that for five years and you have enough money for a vacation. You can use the same mechanism for investments or you can just use the same screen to encourage the user to make investments or to purchase insurance, or to manage finances, such as paying bills. And a huge additional category that we've seen just grown and flourish in the Far East especially, is taking that screen, taking that engagement for payments, and selling non-financial services. A doctor's appointment, a supermarket shop, a song, a massage, a taxi ride, all these things are sold using digital wallets because the customers are engaged. And that is the real business model for payments. And because this evolution goes way beyond financial services, we're seeing something that I think 20 or 30 years ago was not really imaginable. We're seeing industries that are not financial or were not financial by any stretch of the imagination entering the payment sector and then using the model I just described, using the payments data to provide additional financial services and then non-financial services. Let's go through them quickly. Mobility, formerly known as transportation. So the mobility platforms such as Uber or Lyft or in the Far East, Grab, Gojek, in Israel, there's a company called Get. These platforms have a lot of data about us. They know where we travel. They have an app in our phone. And they have our credit card number or sometimes our bank account number for us to make a payment. In fact, that feature is a wallet. It's a digital wallet if you think about it. And especially in the Far East, the mobility players 
have become so sophisticated about how they think about the digital payment aspect of their mobility apps that they spun out the wallet and they made it a standalone service. And you can use their wallet to make purchases in the grocery store and to receive a loan. And in some cases, they go further and start selling additional services to the point that a few years ago, I read a paper that said that mobility is the next strategic threat to banking because they're providing the same services that banks provide. And guess what? They have a lot more data about the user than the financial institution has. Hospitality. You think about companies like Booking.com, Airbnb. They're providing financial services. We book a, a room, we pay them, we travel, we use the room, and after we leave, the platform moves the money to the owner of the room, be it a hotel or a private entrepreneur renting out an apartment. What is that if not a payment service? And now some of these platforms have gone a step further. FinTech divisions. You may have noticed that in some of these platforms, suddenly all of the non-refundable rooms are now refundable. How does that happen? Because not every hotel is willing to offer a non-refundable refundable offer. So they've developed algorithms that manage the financial risk and give another offer with a refundable price. It's probably more expensive, but they can estimate the financial risk that the consumer will cancel. Marketplaces such as Amazon have launched Amazon Pay, provide so many financial services, they've managed to avoid regulation at Amazon. But if you look at the aggregation of all their financial services, it's like a bank. Or if you look at Mercado Libre, which is the Amazon of South America, basically, they've become licensed as a bank in Brazil a number of months ago. And so, in fact, if we look at um, eBay, PayPal was a subsidiary of theirs. Eventually, they understood that it's a standalone business, and they spun it off. In each of these first three categories, another interesting thing is, especially mobility and hospitality, that these entities have all become licensed as payment institutions or e-money licenses or money transmitter licenses, depending on the, on the jurisdiction, because the regulators have understood that these are financial services that need to be regulated in some way. And so the regulatory framework was set up, and that's how it works. And it also gives them legitimacy in the provision of financial services to their customers. Retail. We look at Walmart with Walmart Pay, Carrefour providing credit cards to their customers. In Israel, we have that as well. Loyalty programs. Retail actually has been providing financial services for long, for many years. If you look, think about Tesco, one of the largest retailers in the UK, probably in Europe. They set up a, an entity called Tesco Bank years ago, which initially just managed their credit card issuance, but then they launched current accounts and they really become a bank. And also technology companies have become have started entering this space. If we look, for example, at Wix, Wix is like Shopify, but they're based in Israel. They've set up a division called Wix Payments, enabling merchants, businesses that are selling online to provide all kinds of payment acceptance methods and other financial services. So the world of payments is no longer owned and controlled by financial institutions. It's become much broader, not just for purposes of payment acceptance, but also for purposes of offering financial services. Oh, one other example I wanted to mention, I can't remember if it was Airbnb or booking.com, but one of the hospita hospitality platforms looks at their data, identifies hosts who are kind of like serial entrepreneurs. They can identify that they're saving up more money and then they buy another apartment or rent another apartment, which they then re-rent out on Airbnb. And they realize these people could use a loan to grow faster. And they go ahead and provide these loans. It's another example of a financial services offered by a non-financial entity 
with a very different core business. So what is the strategy for all these platforms? Be they one of the industries that I spoke about or be they big, big tech companies or even traditional pay tech companies or financial institutions. So to make it work, the customer really needs to be in focus and I'll explain what I mean. You take an existing service, transform it into a digital experience, and then embed it in the customer's daily lives. That's what Amazon did by selling products online through their marketplace. Apple, Google, Netflix with media, Spotify with music. All of these entities took things that we were doing anyway and made them digital and integrated them into our daily lives. What payment platforms do is they take payments and related products, turn them into features that meet the customer needs, which is the ability to, to make a payment. And through that, the customer stays engaged with, as I was saying before. The underlying existing elements remain. There's a checking account, a personal loan, a point of sale terminal, and yet they're digital and less visible to the user. So less of a nuisance. The whole idea behind this is to think about it from a customer's perspective. What does the customer expect rather than the provider's perspective? So from a business standpoint, there are a number of reasons that payment platforms are financially attractive. First, they're fee-driven. When you provide a payment service, you charge a fee. Very little risk involved. It's almost like a mover. When the, when the mover moves furniture, they charge for their service and they're done. Yes, they have some fixed costs. They have some capital expenditures up front but they don't have cost of money. So unlike banks, moving on to B, unlike traditional banks, payment companies do not have balance sheet requirements. They don't have capital adequacy requirements for the most part. Makes it easier. If they invest, they might invest in their infrastructure and then just charge for the service. Clearly, they meet a customer need. It's not a solution in search of a problem. And as I explained earlier, it provides customer engagement that enables upselling and cross-selling other products. Those products can be the provider's own products or third parties' products, and then take even less risk. And it's huge. Everyone needs payment services worldwide. Yes, it is competitive and fairly crowded, but there are still pockets in many countries, pockets of opportunities that are not yet exploited. So now I'm going to go into the trend section, which is, um, I, I kind of tried to break it into um, four categories. I'm gonna deep dive a little bit into each one. These will touch on all the topics that will be going into greater length in the other lectures. What I'd like to um, uh, point out is that these are trends that are already taking place and I'm also making predictions about what will happen going forward. I'm not committing. This isn't investment advice and this is not a regulatory view. This is me having been in the industry for many years and kind of reading it and loving it, telling you what I think is going to happen based on what has been happening in the last few years and what's, going, what's happening currently. So four categories, retail, by retail payments, I mean consumers making payments or receiving payments, not necessarily financial institutions making payments to each other or businesses making payments to each other, although we do have a little bit of B2B in there. International markets, I'm gonna say a few words about things that are happening happening around the world. Then we'll talk about trends in digital currencies, even though we have a, a whole lecture or a part of a lecture dedicated to digital currencies 
Here, I'm just kind of giving you the highlights, trends that we're seeing. And then a, a word about scholarship and academia and the lack thereof. And the, if there are academicians among you, there is opportunity to develop new research and thought in this space. So first trend I'd like to point out is the this phenomena of digital platforms entering the payment space. And we all know them. We have digital wallets that we use. Some of them have the names of big tech companies whose main business is something very different from payments. And yet they've begun to impact our lives. We use their payment services or we, we see and read that they have launched payments offerings in other markets. So first let's say that digital distribution channels will continue to penetrate payments. Let me say, there's something called a sales lead. I used to work for a company that sold merchant services to, to small businesses. So we would go to the small business and say, why don't you process your credit card payments through, not through us, but through a processor that we represent. That's called merchant services. And there was a sales manager at another company. And what he did was he brought his salespeople to a mall and he said, okay, you go out, go to all the business owners in this mall and come back with their business cards. Tell them that you want to sell them merchant services and I will incentivize you based on the number of business cards you bring. So every day they'd come back with 20 business cards, 10 business cards, 30 business cards, 50 business cards. And they had little competitions around these business cards. What were those business cards? Those business cards were sales leads. They were an indication that the specific business owner was interested in having a conversation with the sales rep, who in this case was selling merchant services, credit card processing, and that they were willing to receive a phone call and had the name of the business, the name of the owner usually, the phone number, maybe the email address and, and the physical address. That's called a sales lead because we might get a sale out of it. It's very, it used to be, it still is very expensive to get sales leads, certainly when it's done the way I just described. Another way to do it is to make phone calls. Call a thousand people, maybe five of them will buy. How expensive is that and how demoralizing? When we say di digital distribution channels, that entire process has become digital. You don't need to go walk down the hall anymore, and knock on doors and do cold calls and make phone calls. You can market on the internet. You do what's called digital origination. To originate is the same thing as to generate a sales lead. And then you sell the digital financial services online. No human interaction required. Much cheaper and much smarter. And so the digital distribution channels are a very smart and efficient way to offer payment services, which is everything I've just described. That's what, they're, what, that's what these entities are doing. And that's going to continue. And these platforms are going to continue to build into additional financial services, not just payments, savings, investments, and so on, as well as non-financial services and products, which I described. They use their network effect to bring more customers. So a platform has this, this, this phenomena that the more you use it, the more you want to use, the more you use it. Think about the WhatsApp messaging platform. If everyone's using it, how can you not? It doesn't matter if you like it or not. The network pulls you in. And the big techs leverage the network effect. It applies to almost all platforms. And the fintech entities want to leverage these network effects by using the big tech platforms, or they want to become platforms themselves, or the platforms want to become fintechs. 
And the banks are pursuing the same model. So traditionally, banks were institutions, they still are institutions that accept deposits from the public. They are regulated for that reason. And they're even further regulated because they take those deposits and give them out as loans. That's their traditional business, which requires minimal levels of capital advocacy. However, if they do other things like digital distribution of financial services, and they do do these, and they also use their platforms as a way to sell other services, what we're seeing is that their valuations increase dramatically. There was a report published, published by McKinsey, it was their annual banking report that explained this and analyzed it. The more banks engage in digital origination and distribution of services, rather than just giving out their own money, the more profitable, the more, the more, the more highly valued they are on the public markets. Neobanks, which are digital banks that have no branches, they're also known as challenger banks, depending which region you're in, seek to pursue the same model, and they are pursuing the same model. What we're also seeing is an electronification of compliance, which means it used to be no one would open a bank account for a consumer unless that consumer walked into the branch, showed a photo ID, and the bank clerk identified them and got them to sign with wet ink. Better blue ink than black ink, because then you really know it's an original signature. That whole process has gone out the window. We have lots of fintech companies, including here in Israel, that enable the whole thing to be digital. Take a photo of your ID, take a photo of multiple forms of your ID, do some strong authentication, send them a one-time password, get them to put it into another platform, run some algorithms on the photos of the ID to make sure that it's authentic, cross-reference it with some of the government databases, and boom, you've authenticated the customer and you can open an account for them. That will continue because without it, digital platforms can't survive. And of course, artificial intelligence will continue to identify opportunities for smart credit underwriting and new opportunities for loans that they perhaps wouldn't have given before. Let me tell you something. To give out the amount of time it takes to evaluate risk and underwrite a loan for $10,000 is not very different from the amount of time it takes to evaluate a loan for a million dollars. Where is the bank going to make more money? They're going to put their time into the larger loans. And then the small businesses don't get access to capital and all kinds of credit needs are not met. But if it's all digital, it becomes less expensive, especially if the risk is also lower. And so we're seeing new types of credit offerings thanks to the digital platforms and the AI that they apply. The downside of all this is destructive innovation. We like to talk about disruptive innovation. And yes, there are positive aspects to innovation disrupting the way things were always done. Makes things more efficient, perhaps more user-friendly. But in the last few years, we've begun hearing the term destructive innovation, because guess what? Innovation can also destroy. And it does destroy. Think about what happened in the elections in the United States and in some other markets. Personal data was gathered about users, and they were manipulated into thinking things that they otherwise would not have thought and voting in ways they would not have otherwise voted because the logarithms were intentionally designed to work in a particular way. What if a digital platform decides to apply the same type of business process to financial services? What if a consumer is interested in buying a house and she needs a mortgage and she thinks she can afford a mortgage for 300,000 euros, but 
the logarithm will convince her in one way or another through various digital manipulation, understanding her data and tendencies and needs. She will be persuaded through these digital channels and data that she can actually afford a 500,000 year old loan and not a 300,000 year old loan. And she'll be somehow encouraged to purchase a more expensive house than she originally intended, even though she can't really afford it. And they'll find a more risk prone lender to give her the loan. And guess what? Eventually, she will get into financial trouble. And that is a fairly tender scenario. There are much more vicious ones. Convincing a consumer to pay a higher interest rate because the lender connects emotionally without human interaction. These are examples. These are examples I just made up. They are examples of what we can call destructive innovation. We would be fooling ourselves to think that does not already happen. It has always happened. Part of marketing is getting people to do things that they would not have otherwise done. That's why we market. And yet, when it comes to financial services, it could impact financial stability. And it somehow seems a lot less fair. And so if destructive innovation is already taking place, I'm predicting, and I'm not the only one who's predicting this, that destructive innovation will grow and it will cause the regulators to step in. Well, what will the regulators do? They can increase licensing requirements for tech companies that are acting in the financial sector because they're not being regulated as banks. So maybe they need another type of license or maybe they need a bank license. Maybe they need to partner with a bank. By the way, this is already happening. Some of the tech companies will get licensed. And you know what? They're pretty sophisticated and they can handle it. Some of them will decide that they don't want to be regulated and they'll do everything they can and structure themselves in a way that they avoid regulation, perhaps providing services to traditional financial institutions that would buy the destructive innovation types of practices as a service. And maybe these entities will do both. They will become a bank themselves and they will also services to financial institutions. Areas of focus in the regulation of this new world include uh, protecting privacy and personal data, especially in the EU and in California and the United States where there is particular attention here. Um, we'll say more about, uh, I'll say more about central bank digital currencies later. It's this idea that central banks will issue fiat money, so US dollar, euro, and Israeli shekel um, in digital format rather than just as bank, rather than banknotes and coins. And one of the issues being discussed there is, can we keep it anonymous the way we keep cash anonymous? Because it's now digital. And this is actually quite a big issue, especially in countries that value privacy. So if they're valuing privacy when it comes to government issued money, what about more traditional types of money that are moved on payment platforms um, by tech companies. So long way of saying privacy is actually a big deal. Competition. So competition authorities are active in the payment space. There was a recent case against Apple for, um, for them not opening Apple Pay to third parties. Um, and, not, and there was another case a little, I don't know, maybe a year or two ago, I can't remember exactly, um, about um, Apple not allowing external payment apps, um, sorry, external payment methods as a means of payment for um, apps that are downloaded from the Apple store because their fees were viewed as too high. Um, and so the competition authorities, it's taken time, but in some jurisdictions, they've become much more active um, in, in an effort to protect fair competition in the payment space. Big question when it comes to technology platforms should the regulator be regulating the entity or the activity? So one argument that um, we have heard is that 
if a technology platform offers a loan, why should they not be subject to fair lending requirements the way a bank is subject to fair lending requirements? So let's look at the activity and regulate that is what we're being told as regulators. When you take a closer look at it though, it's very difficult to do that because if you just wanna regulate the activity, what if the same entity engages in multiple activities? So what are you going to do? You're going to have multiple regulators on the same entity, or you're going to have different types of regulation on the same entity because they're both giving out loans and selling insurance. So regulating the activity through all the literature that we've seen doesn't really, it doesn't hold water when you analyze it. And so we come back to the idea of regulating the entity. So you regulate it as a bank, you regulate it as an insurance company. You regulate it as a securities broker, even if they engage in more than one activity. Another point here, though, is that the traditional dichotomies don't work. We used to say either it's an entity that touches the money, in which case regulation is closer, or an entity that moves money but doesn't touch the money, where regulation can be lighter. It's a good way of thinking. It's an interesting way to organize our, our rules, but many entities do both. They will both touch the money and move the money depending on the use case. That's especially true when it comes to digital, digital currencies. This other idea of, is the entity giving out credit, giving out loans against deposits that it accepted from the public or not? Because if it is, it's a bank. And if it's not, then it's probably something else and it doesn't need to be subject to the same types of capital advocacy requirements and other regulations. So this dichotomy, again, it's either, it's either A or B, the lines don't, the lines get blurred when it comes to some use cases, especially in DeFi, decentralized finance, where entities are working using distributed ledger technologies, blockchain, to create new financial products and services. Um, topic of its, on its own. So all these basic concepts need to be revisited and will be revisited. They are being re revisited actually. And the IEMF just issued a report last month that said, you know what, we're going to look at neobanks. So remember I said earlier, neobanks and challenger banks, these are the digital banks, banks that have no branches. They're basically launching their own platforms. And yet, in order to encourage competition in many markets, especially in Europe and, and the UK, some of the regulatory and supervision principles were eased to make it easier for them to function and to, and to come onto market. But what happened was, because these are digital platforms that don't have banks, it was very difficult, still is very difficult for them to become the first bank. They're usually a second or third bank, and they find themselves giving uncollateralized loans which means more risk. And for many of these entities, their risk management systems have not been tested yet by economic downturns. And what the IMF is saying is, you know what, we need to take a closer look at these entities, maybe increase their capital requirements because if they all fail, they could actually create systemic risk, putting our entire economy at risk. So much for destructive innovation. I'll try to move through the next ones faster. Digital wallets. So, you know, the famous ones are Apple Pay and Google Pay, but there are many others, Samsung Pay. Um, so we've already seen that if you take the total pool of payments, the volumes on digital wallets are increasing at much faster rates than the volumes on physical plastic cards. Now, let's not get confused. When I say a physical plastic card, I'm not talking about the credentials on the card. So then if, I, if it's my credit card, so it's my name, it's the 16 digits that are my card number, my, the expiration date, the quote on the back, those are my credentials. I'm not talking about those because often I store those credentials in the digital wallet. But when I make the payment with the digital wallet, with my, my phone, 
then I'm not using the physical plastic card. And I think eventually the increase in the use of wallets will overtake the use of physical plastic cards. Is this a big deal? You know, I'm not too worried about the companies that make the plastic cards. Maybe for the environment, it's even good. And by the way, we're seeing more and more virtual cards being offered. So you don't even get a plastic card. You just get a picture of it in your app or on the website. It is, however, there are two issues here that are worth thinking about, which is one, as consumers, are we gaining more control or losing control over our finances? One could argue that we're gaining more control because it could be part of an app, mobile app, where you track your expenses and you can see everything, everywhere you've spent your money and how much you've spent and analyze it. On the other hand, there is something about the friction of holding a physical plastic card and certainly holding cash, but I'm talking about a physical plastic card that makes you think twice, maybe, because you have to physically put it in the machine and put in your code or even just tap it. It's it feels physical. You get the fact emotionally that you're paying more. So I think that trend will continue. Big tech digital wallets will continue to grow and win. You know, we just had, just had a conversation with one of the uh, uh, local fintech entrepreneurs today who mentioned that um, it's not fair that um, Google and Google and Apple get beneficial treatment. And maybe they do from a regulatory perspective. I'm not saying yes or no. But he says, you know, the other wallets have no chance against them because I'll fill in the blank because they're so good. Right. And why are they so good? Because they have a lot of money. They put a lot into R&D. They do a lot of research, uh, uh, consumer behavior research. And they have experience from multiple markets. And the knowledge feeds itself. So I predict, I'm not saying whether this is good or bad, but I do predict that they will get bigger and bigger and they will become platforms for more things other than payments. And so partnership with them financial institutions partnerships with them will become even more essential because they will come to the conclusion, these financial institutions, that without such partnerships, they will be a lot less relevant. And the acceptance of digital wallets has, exp has expanded significantly. You know, if a retailer accepts payment by tap, so contactless payment, um, then that same technology enables payment by digital wallet. That technology in Israel, we've um, we've exceeded 78. I think we're at now 80% of point of sale terminals accept this technology. Um, and it has certainly filtered down to the smaller retailers. And I think that will continue. And we will probably, in many markets, achieve close to 100% of acceptance of digital wallets. Now, this thing called a super app or a super wallet. Remember, I talked about how a a digital platform can enable you to make a payment, but then it can also enable you to do other financial things. And then it can also enable you to do non-financial things, you know, order a ride on a taxi or, or buy, a, buy a massage. So depending on the market and what people are writing about, people tend to call, use the word in the West, not in the Far East. When we say super app, the tendency is to mean multiple financial services on one screen, including payments. And what I've seen is that the word super wallet is broader. So it's not just not multiple financial services, but it's also non-financial services. What I can tell you for sure is that in the Far East, they're just called super apps and they have it all, all the financial and non-financial. But those will continue to emerge in the West. They're not very strong yet. They've been around for quite a while in the Far East. And there are two models for them call it A, financial services, and B, the aggregator model. When I say financial services, what I mean is, and this isn't my term, what I mean is um, if an entity provides a loan, they provide a, a, a payment platform, and then they also provide the user a loan or an opportunity to take a loan. That money comes from the entity operating the platform. It's like a bank. The aggregator model 
and that applies to all the financial services. The aggregator model is very different. The aggregator generates leads, sales leads. Remember, we talked about we talked about what sales leads are. Generates sales leads for third parties that it aggregates. So the platform will go to an insurance company and say, hey, you want me to sell insurance for you? Put it on the app. It'll go to a foreign currency conversion provider and say, hey, you want me to sell foreign currency conversion for you? Put it on the app. It'll go to a mobility platform and say, hey, you want me to sell taxi rides for you? Put it on the app. And suddenly the wallet has become a lot more than what that wallet provider or platform provider does on its own. And its biggest business ends up being distribution, digital distribution of third-party services. So I think those two models are going to continue to grow. I, if I had to guess, I would say the aggregator model will win, but I am not, I am not well informed enough, and this is still too early to make a guess. So I think both models, certainly in the immediate immediate term, will continue to grow. They're very early days in the West. Um, and when we say whether super apps or super wallets, we will we mean that the apps will enable not only payments, but also money management, such as paying bills, building a budget, working with a budget, borrowing money, investing money, and also using crypto. We've seen more and more examples of these platforms enabling, in addition to traditional financial services, enabling users to buy and sell cryptocurrencies and also to hold cryptocurrencies. And then we think, I think that these platforms, and we're beginning to see this, will also do other things like digital identification. You know, why do I need to carry a driver's license? Why do I need to carry a physical ID card? Um, medical records. Why don't I have all my medical records in the same place? Insurance, insurance policies. All of these things are just data. And they will probably also be hosted in the apps and will help users function more easily. Next slide, credit card debt, another interesting trend. We saw during the pandemic that the volumes of credit card debt decreased. People were stuck at home. They had less risk appetite. Many of them were either temporarily unemployed or some of, for some of them, it became permanent, sometimes by choice, sometimes not by choice. And so they felt less comfortable taking out credit. They probably were also less credit worthy. But something else happened. Consumer credit through alternative methods. So consumers were no longer dependent on their credit card issuer to take out credit. This, is, this information is mainly US-based. I think also true in some of the European countries. Um, but they, they, so they weren't only dependent on credit card issuers to take out credit, but there were alternative credit providers that came to market, usually through digital platforms. So I don't think credit card debt, I'm not talking about debt, I'm talking about credit card debt. I don't think it will fully bounce back. And again, it's not just me, it's based on things we're reading. Um, because much of the credit has already migrated to other credit platforms, including things like person to person, where people give each other loans on these platforms. But the bigger one is buy now, pay later platforms. So during the purchase process, the buyer, the consumer is offered the opportunity to pay off the transaction amount in installments. And the lender is not necessarily the credit card issuer, but a third party BNPL fintech company. Many of these have very high, value, high valuations. It seems to be an unmet need that has, is now being met and there's much demand for it. Very interesting, by the way, that in the Israel market, we've had buy now, pay later propositions since the credit card industry was created. Um, and it is now, um, it has now become a global phenomenon. And one of the companies that made that happen is an Israeli company. But post-pandemic, we're also seeing more travel, more leisure. You go to see movies and performances more often, more hospitality because you travel more, use hotels more. 
And so the fact that there's more travel, leisure, and hospitality after COVID-19, we hope we're after it, but let's say after the, the, the more difficult parts of COVID-19, that will increase credit card balances because when you go on vacation or when you consume travel and leisure, it's more likely, it's highly likely that you'll put these expenses on credit cards. And as a result, some of these are big ticket items. So you'll roll them over from month to month and pay interest bearing credit um, in order to pay off these expenses. So I think that will help bring credit card debt back, but not to the same levels. Another big trend that we're seeing are, is instant payments and payment initiation. I put them on the same slide, even though they're not the same thing. Instant payments are when money moves from one bank account to another bank account instantaneously. For those who don't know, I'll let you in on a big secret, a well-known secret. The money doesn't really move instantaneously. It still takes three days, like wire transfers or ACH transfers, but the, a, the instant payment schemes or faster payments, in Israel we call them faster payments, have rules that require the banks to take a credit risk against each other. So if I make an instant payment to my friend, my bank won't really move the money to my friend's bank for three days. It won't be final. There won't be finality of payment for three days. But I will immediately see my account debited and my friend will immediately see his account credited and he will immediately be able to use the money through a set of rules that enable the banks to take risks against each other. Um, this is a space that is growing um, and is viewed by many as competitive with payment cards. I am not sure that that's the place where it will grow. I think it will grow in new use cases. So give you an example, an online brokerage. An app um, finally convinces my daughter to download and suggests to her that she should make an investment with her hard-earned hard earned money. Why don't you invest $100 in the securities of company A? If she downloads the app and identifies herself, and goes through the whole KYC process, know your customer digitally, and then she needs to move those $100 onto the app in order to buy the shares of the company that the app convinced her to buy, if she has to wait three days to complete the wire transfer before the online brokerage really knows they received the money, the chances that they'll convince her to continue to use the money and invest there decrease significantly. If they can get her to do it immediately, high chances that she'll complete the process. And so an instant payments are a way to make that happen. Alternative payment methods are um, various apps that we see in multiple countries, enabling people to pay each other, um, usually by accessing each other's banks accounts. Um, and instant payments are a great way to do that because people don't want to wait three days when they're paying each other. Peer-to-peer -peer payments are the same. Government payments are also interesting, both for customs taxes. So, so if I buy something, there's lots of international e-commerce now, more and more growing every year. I go on... AliExpress, buy a shirt, or that's not a good example, buy an, a piece of, an electronic piece of electronic equipment, it gets stuck at the port, and then the courier calls me and says, I need to release this from customs, you need to pay me 200 shekels, and then I'll release it for you. We'd like that to happen instantaneously, because they have a logistics challenge. If they don't get the money instantaneously, then... They have to sit on the product and store it, and then I have to pay for storage fees, and they have to come and call me again, and it's not a good experience. So they could take my credit card, which is what they do now, but they'd rather pay a lower fee, and instant payments typically have lower fees. So that's another good example of a place where instant payments can grow, and other taxes as well. The government doesn't like um, paying high fees for collecting taxes, and so instant payments are a way to make that happen. Utilities payments are another place that, that could be interesting as well as payouts such as insurance claims. So any entity that needs to pay uh, to pay its customers. So if I submit an insurance claim 
and I'm now entitled to receive whatever it is, $1,000 from my insurance company um, to give good service, the insurance company wants me to get the money immediately. And so that's another place where they may want to use instant payments. I didn't say anything about payment initiation. Payment initiation is really a, a category of open banking, which means that a third party, a fintech, can step into my shoes as a consumer and with my consent, access my bank account and move money from my bank account to another bank account. Everything I said about instant payments could also apply to payment initiation if they use the instant payments infrastructure. Okay, increased interoperability. So we're seeing in Europe that there are mobile wallets popping up in various countries and gaining huge, huge traction. You know, 60, 70, 80% of the population using these wallets. And yet the EU wants to be one single European economic area. Um, and they don't want a different consumer experience in every market. So um, I have a conference I like to go to called Money 2020 in Amsterdam. And they have an app. I think it's called Tiki, if I'm not mistaken. This is a real story. When I went last time, the taxi driver said, why don't you just pay me using Tiki? And I said, what's Tiki? I should have known because I'm from the industry. So the idea is that if I'm a European and my home app is not Tiki, but my neighboring European country's app is Tiki, I should be able to make a payment from my home app to another country's app and the reverse. And so also in Israel, we're looking at um, asking the wallet providers to be interoperable with each other. So we're thinking about, um, I think, Globally, regulators are thinking about, well, maybe wallets, uh, digital wallets should be able to pay each other and not just enable people using the same wallet to uh, send and receive payments amongst them. Um, and then another very interesting space, which I think will take some time, but I have a feeling will happen, is interoperability among various payment methods. So I should say various means of payment. So let's say I have a digital wallet and my friend doesn't have a digital wallet, but she has a digital check platform, which doesn't exist in most countries. We are launching a digital check platform. We're working on that, which will be a national scheme in Israel. So if anybody on the line would like to be involved with that, please contact us. It's a very exciting project we're working on, but let's just say it exists already. And so consumer A wants to move money from his digital wallet into consumer B's um, digital check platform. Can you use a credit card to pay someone that doesn't accept credit cards but does accept checks? Or can you write a check or a digital check to a business that doesn't accept checks but does accept credit cards? Those are just examples of two different means of payment or, you know, which are not currently interoperable. I think what's happening in the world is that we're going into such a fragmented space with so many different types of payment methods that it's hard to keep track. And that eventually we will start seeing integration of different, interoperability of different payment means of payment, um, either voluntarily as a business initiative or possibly as a result of regulatory initiatives. And no, this is not me saying this is something we're doing or leading, it's just a theory, an academic theory that I'm putting out there that I think will happen. I think um, the mass market initiatives and payments are pretty well covered. What we're seeing more of are focuses on niche areas, certainly by some of the FinTech companies. So government payments, governments are typically the largest merchants. If you think of a government as a business, it's the largest business in every market. And yet they tend to be quite old fashioned, um, not adopting uh, new digital advanced payment methods. That has changed in recent years. They're adopting more, not as quickly as some of the um, private merchants. So I think offerings to governments, helping them digitize faster and better will grow. Cross-border payments, there's lots to do. Business to business payments, um, lots of uh, requirements there, invoice integration, ERP integration. Custodial human relationships, so 
um, a child of an elderly parent that needs to look after his finances um, as his custodian, a parent of a child needing wanting that child to be able to, to make a purchase, be it lunch or be it, um, I don't know, ice cream on the way home, um, incapable or incompetent individuals who have custodians um, and, and those, those, those individuals have funds and uh, need to be looked after. So the caretaker needs to be paid or perhaps food and clothing needs to be purchased for that incompetent individual. How do we make sure that works in a fair manner and has all the controls in place required? I think we're gonna see more of those. We're seeing more offerings there, but I think those will grow. Some hyper-local scenarios, so religion-based banking, Islamic banking is a big one. Um, alternate Orthodox Jews also have similar requirements, basically uh, an aversion to credit or prohibition on credit. Good Samaritan principles, so um, every payment I make will get rounded up and the amount rounded up will be donated to a charity of my choice. Um, emerging markets with mobile payments, um, Already, there are lots of very cool things happening in some of the emerging markets that kind of leapfrogged um, um, legacy financial systems as soon as the mobile phones came on board. And I think those will only continue to develop and financial inclusion propositions in countries where large segments of the population are not banked or they're underbanked. Identity and authentication, being able to identify a customer when you want to onboard them and give them a, an account is a big challenge. We think there will be um, more uh, national databases of identities and some of those will may actually become internationally interoperable. And so it will make it easier for new market entrants to offer financial services because if a new FinTech wants to issue a credit card, it needs to go through the entire uh, know your customer KYC process with the consumer and that's a barrier to entry. If there is a national identity database that makes that process more digital and easier and faster, that new FinTech will have an easier time entering the market. It will improve competition, lower friction, and may also help improve cross-border payments. So all that was under real payments, real retail, retail payments. Let me go through quickly, quickly through emerging markets. I um, think that what we're seeing in some of the emerging markets that leapfrogged legacy technologies like Africa and China um, just went straight to mobile payments and developed propositions there that we still have yet to see in the West. I think they will continue to offer new propositions. Another example is in El Salvador and in the Ukraine because of their security situation where they've become begun accepting Bitcoin as legal tender. Um, these are things that are only happening in emerging markets. And so they're actually moving faster than some of the Western markets. But I think something else we'll see in emerging markets is that they will, um, will, will pull back. So China's reigning in um, Alipay and WeChat Pay um, and launching CBDC to provide other types of digital currency to their um, uh, consumers, um, not necessarily on blockchain or using digital ledger technology. So it is quite cutting edge. Um, uh, uh, so why are they doing that? Because they, they, there's a sense there, according to the press, that Alipay and WeChat Pay have just become too strong. They have too much data on the consumers. And so China's kind of put, pulling back, but also providing an, trying to provide an alternative. Um, also, cryptocurrencies are quite volatile. So in more vulnerable countries, such as El Salvador and Ukraine, um, they actually may create more systemic risk. And so these markets, I think, will ultimately pull back from their decisions. Localization of payment systems. So when there was a threat um, to um, cut off Russia from SWIFT when they invaded Crimea, the Russians realized this was a real risk for them and they developed an alternative to SWIFT. It's not quite as good or sophisticated or functional as SWIFT, but they do have an alternative. And um, China also developed their own alternative. It may be the case that this fear that this will happen in other markets will trigger additional markets with tenuous political situations to develop their own alternatives to SWIFT. I think we'll see more of that localization of these systems. Um, and in Europe for years, they've been talking about a European card scheme. 
Not sure that's going to happen, but I still think there is an appetite there to do something European, maybe an account to account scheme because they're quite um, progressed in the account to account space, things like instant payments um, and other markets may develop, may consider developing similar um, propositions. Digital currencies. I said we're going to have a session on digital currencies here. I'm talking about trends, though. So as a trend, I would mention first category of digital currencies are central bank digital currencies, where the central bank issues fiat money, be it a dollar, a euro, a shekel, a pound. Um, they, they, the central bank issues it digitally as a token rather than as a banknote or coin. So some commentators look at China and the US and they feel like the two of them are racing. Who's going to be first with its digital yuan or digital dollar to market as a way of global dominance, hoping that this digital currency will be accepted globally. Um, I think the global race for dominance in the financial sector will never go away. It's part of our realpolitik. Um, I don't know if that will continue in CBDCs. Um, time will tell, but it is certainly something that's a trend, I think, something that is happening. Um, I think the entire focus in like most central banks in the world now are looking at CBDCs um, will cool down. That's just me speaking. That's definitely not the Bank of Israel speaking because I don't, I'm not sure we see a clear business case for uh, CBDCs. I think payment systems do work quite well. Most money is already digital. I don't see a clear reason why we need to have uh, uh, central bank digital currencies. However, big however, there are unique scenarios that would justify issuing CBDCs, just wholesale, such as for wholesale payments between financial institutions, among financial institutions, and certainly for cross-border payments, if we could integrate the CBDC systems of multiple countries, it will improve the cross-border experience where there is a real pain point. Stable coins are digital currencies that are pegged to a stable financial asset. The easiest example is take a digital currency issuer that says, for every one token worth X fiat, I will keep X fiat in reserve at a bank, which is also audited. Um, most stable coins do not work that way. They have other types of assets that they claim to be the assets to which the stable coins are pegged. Um, but for stable coins, there is a reason to exist. And that is that it enables trading in cryptocurrencies um, with less friction. So rather than taking a US dollar from a bank account and buying a Bitcoin and then selling the Bitcoin and putting the money back in the US dollar bank account and going back and forth, that process has a lot of friction, both for regulatory and administrative reasons. Instead, you move the dollar to a stable coin, and from the stable coin, you, 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 you sell the stable coin to buy the Bitcoin, then you sell the Bitcoin and get a stable coin. You go back and forth between the stable coins and the cryptocurrencies. That happens more easily. Um, I think there are questions around whether stable coins will be pegged to currencies that are smaller and smaller economies. I think the answer is yes, because the smaller economies are also big enough to justify a business case if they just charge a fee for every transaction. Uh, I think both the fully collateralized and the less than fully collateralized stable coins have business cases. If they're less than fully collateralized. They can also make money on, um, on, the, on the spread between the percentage held in reserve and the percentage um, held by the investors. Um, I think certainly regulation will emerge in this space. There's lots happening, lots of papers being published um, for several reasons. One, it feels very similar to a fiat currency and central banks are keeping a close eye on, well, you know, the issuer of a fiat currency is a central bank. That's one of the ways that central banks uh, manage monetary policies by managing the uh, amount of money in circulation. So really need to keep an eye on that. So I think that's one reason to regulate. Also, it feels a little bit like a bank. If the reserve is less than 100%, then is this a capital adequacy discussion? And it also, they also function as payment systems because multiple entities can move money between them, uh, can move value between them. Um, and so, but I think one, one other thing that will happen is that the increased regulation in this space will increase legitimacy of this space. 
programmatic cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin and the several thousand others. We're seeing the FATF travel rule requiring crypto exchanges to implement the tra to, to track the source of funds. That will make uh, it easier to to trade and hold and 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 sell cryptocurrencies and deposit the proceeds in bank accounts. Um, we also see large institutional investors investing in cryptocurrencies, and so as a result, they will probably become more legitimate. Um, we're also seeing traditional payment platforms integrating cri cryptocurrencies. We see payment gateways enabling payment using crypto. We're seeing payment cards, credit cards, debit cards. Um, pegged to crypto. So if I make a payment in uh, using a, a Visa card that's connected to a crypto exchange, I'm, I am actually paying in crypto. I'm selling the crypto, converting it to, let's say, a euro and then making payment in euro. But it is a way to, to, to convert it into a means of payment. I don't think that will become mass market because as these investment vehicles become more legitimate, it will be easier to cash out and we won't need these mechanisms. And also, you know, cryptocurrencies are, are, are investment, financial assets for investment. So, um, so are brokerage accounts. So how many of us have brokerage accounts where we hold securities? And how many of us have a credit card from our brokerage account? You know, if I own shares in company A, A, B, and C, and then I also have some cash in my brokerage account, do I get a credit card from that brokerage account so that every time I spend money in the supermarket, I'm selling Securities, I just don't see that as a use case that's going to become mass market. Um, it, it will probably grow, but not replace existing means of payment. DeFi, decentralized finance will continue to grow, mainly because um, it is bringing new financial products on to market, but it is these are generally quite volatile and uh, appropriate for speculative investments. Last quick slide about scholastic research. There isn't enough of it in academia. There's all kinds of topics that could be explored. And if there's anyone here that wants to talk to me about that, I'm interested in exploring them also academically. So payments as a springboard for other financial services. Um, we talked about the data being a good way to offer credit. Um, e increasing the use of, or the study of big data from uh, payment systems to understand and influence consumer behavior, to engage in now casting, uh, macroeconomically and for monetary reasons, monetary policy, um, studying, using the big data to study network effects and the benefits and dangers of big tech's activities and financial services. Um, another space to examine is the interoperability and interconnectedness among payments providers um, to look at systemic risk. And um, also how do we balance uh, from a regulatory perspective the um, uh, the need for privacy protection, the need for um, um, financial inclusion. There's an F missing on the slide and correlation with the shadow economy with the idea that the more electronic services, electronic payments there are in a market, the less the shadow economy. So we have one minute left. If anybody wants to ask a question, um, we'll keep it for next time. We still have 69 people. Phenomenal. Did you all even hear me? Uh, yes, I thank have, you very much. Yes. yes. I, thank do, you. I do have a small question. Thank Go you. Forward. Who's speaking? Ilan. Ilan what? Uh, Bislish. Okay. I have, I have a question you. regarding the, the interaction between the different services about rebundling and debundling of the services. How do you see the, 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 the future? Well, I think we're absolutely, you know, I, I debated whether to put that on as a, as a, as a trend. I'm glad I, did, I didn't because I ran out of time. But um, I definitely think that the increasing fragmentation of means of payment is going to get too complicated for the consumer. And then either third parties or the issuers of payment of, 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 of the, the managers of payment platforms themselves will start coming up with ways to rebundle some of the means of payments and other financial services. I, I, I think pendulum is swinging towards fragmentation and it will swing back. Otherwise, uh, or, or some of these smaller players will, will go out of business. The, the, the consumer just cannot handle 
so many different ways of payment. And the conversion? And the conversion. That's also why I talked about interoperability between multiple means of payment. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, Odette, thank you very much. Okay. The first lecture. Looking forward to the next one in two weeks. Absolutely. The same link. Same time, same place, same link, even though we're all virtual. Yes. Looking forward to seeing you all again. Thanks for joining. Okay. Thank you, Dad. Thank you very Bye -bye. much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, I'm very sorry. I'm from London. I mixed up the times. Is it any way I can see the recording of this video? Yes, it will be published on the Bank of Israel YouTube channel as well as on the Gershon Fintech Center's website. Yes, we will send a, we will send a, a mail about it when it's ready. Great. Uh, perhaps I'll, I'll send you a quick email as well just to uh, yeah, let oh. you know. Everybody right. who, are, who was uh, registered will get an email about it. Oh, yeah, I've registered. Yeah. Bye bye. Such a rookie mistake. Apologies. I appreciate you putting the recording out. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.